Hey, welcome to Anonymous Corner, bringing you another episode of Unanimous Decision. And today, who are we talking to, Bill? Hey, you heard what they say, Unanimous Decision. That's our exclusive interview series. And today, we got a good one. Stepping a little out of our, our field for a little bit, but you know, we bring the heat. We got a guy, he starred in, in the movie in 1993, Cop and a Half. You guys know, that's one of the biggest movies of 1993. Today, he's an actor. He's a writer. He's a producer. Today we have Norman D. Golden II. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, let's get ready to rumble! Here we go. Norman, welcome to the show. How are you feeling today? I'm feeling great, man. Thanks for having me. I, I, I'm glad to be here to chat with y'all. Okay. I know you guys, uh, you guys, I know you're out in the uh, West Coast, LA. Um, you mm -hmm. ready to step in this ring? Let's go. <laughs> All right, let's get it. All right, you yeah. had an amazing start to your career, right? You start uh -huh. opposite of um, Burt Reynolds um, <laughs> in a movie, 1993, called Cop and the Half. That's the um, one. I remember the poster. Burt Reynolds, you had everything. That's one of the most memorable. Handcuffs. For me, yep. handcuffs, <laughs> post. That's one of the most memorable uh, promo posters that I can remember from that time. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times we, we don't look at child actors, child musicians as workers. You know, we see them yeah. as far as in movies, we see them on TV shows, we hear them, but we don't think of them as working. Uh, what, were the, what, were the, what was the process like for you, uh, for you to shoot your movie as a child actor? Um, well, you know, it was pretty much the process of what any, you know, adult, um, any of my adult counterparts, if you will, um, would have to go through the auditioning process. You know, once you book the gig, you know, you're depending on what, like with this, in this case, it was, you know, a film, excuse me. So, you know, it's, uh, it was a three and a half month film a three and a half month shoot. Okay. So you know, you're on set on, it was shot in uh, Florida. Obviously I live in LA, I lived in LA at the time as well. So I had to drive, uh, uh, you know, live in Florida basically for three months. Um, and yeah, and something that you mentioned, you know, it was very interesting how, you know, the, the lifestyle or the challenges that, you know, child actors face, you know, many don't quite understand, you know, the sacrifices that first, you know, like your parents, make for me to be able to, to do that you know and uh you know just the the, the entire process i mean it, it it looked you know from the outside it's like oh the kids you know they're famous they're in lights and the name is in lights and this and that but you know it really is um it's a lifestyle that is it's it's different you know than than your average you know um you know lifestyle so first of all, i want to say you know I always i always you know give kudos and um you know, respect to my parents for the sacrifices that they made for allowing me to be able to live my dream at such a young age, considering, you know, they had a family. I have two older, two older siblings. So, you know, trying to juggle, you know, keeping some sense of normalcy, you know, in our family with, you know, uh, you know, having, you know, me being able to experience this opportunity was is, is, a, is amazing. Did, you know, but um, how does how do child labor laws work as far as you, the child actors and actresses? So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to get back to that. Uh, okay. So um, basically the way that it works, there are labor laws, obviously, for yeah. children. Um, namely, it's just the number of hours that you can work. Um, and there's a lot of laws around like the type of the exposure, the type of things that you are able to do, um, you know, obviously. With entertainment, you know, there's there's a lot of uh, rules that are sometimes, you know, bent, which is why they have, you know, uh, sometimes child protective services or, you know, they have a they'll have social workers kind of come in on the set to check and make sure that everything is, is up to speed, um, that all the you know, they'll do like a little audit of the, the time sheets and to make sure that, OK, well, Norman can only work, you know, six or eight hours a day. It, it shouldn't be a timestamp for eight and a half or nine hours because the director just needed to get this last shot. It's like, well, you didn't get it today. If Norman's at his eight hours, 
you know, you got to get it tomorrow. And more, uh, most importantly, uh, the educational aspect, like, you know, cause I was obviously in school. Well, actually when Cop and a Half was shot, I was in my last like um, month of school when we went into uh, physical, you know, principal photography production. So I had to have a set teacher you know, to make sure that I finished, you know, all of my, my, my school work before summer break. Um, and then that set te teacher actually acts as a social worker as well, just kind of like a watchdog, making sure that, you know, everything is uh, taken care of. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. So um, it number one, it does seem, I, I know you're talking off of memory, but it does seem like you're very in tune with what was going on mm -hmm. on the set. Mm -hmm. So I want to bring mm -hmm. up, I, I do think when the movie first came out, so I remember watching it in the second grade, this is the year after when it was on VHS. So 94. Uh, yeah. 94, yeah. So it would have been on uh, 94. I watched it, but uh, critics were tough on it, you know, like mm -hmm. uh, on, on you and Bert. Uh, but ultimately, mm -hmm. you know, the film was beloved by young audiences. Right. And I'm biased because yeah. at the time, you know, I'm a 10 year old, uh, well, yeah. eight year old. So uh, it, it became a box office success, you know, almost three times mm -hmm. the uh, production budget. So definitely mm -hmm. that's a plus there. Were you paying attention to the press back then and um, or were your parents uh, typically shielding you from uh, some of that feedback? I wasn't paying attention and my parents did shield shield me from a lot of that, which is the best thing that they mm -hmm. could have done. Um, I, you know, I I was I've always been told that I'm an old soul. I probably mm -hmm. wouldn't have cared yeah. <laughs> anyway about the negative, you know, because for me, I was doing what I love to do. Yeah, you know, and I, you know, have, having gotten to that point to be able to to be able to you know shot a movie and it's in theaters and like I none of that all of that was just like it really was a dream come true. So, mm -hmm. man, there was nothing, <laughs> and my at the time it was released, I was nine. There was nothing that you could have told my nine year old self that would have discouraged me from wanting to do more and you know eventually you know keep you know continuing a career like I did. Um, you know, and of course, as we all know, there's there's an interesting component <laughs> yeah. that is associated yeah. with, you know, that um, that negative press, if you yeah. will, um, because if you look at, you know, the, the feedback for the film was was rather rather polarizing in a sense that the critics and some of the industry people were like, yeah, they 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 panned it a bit. But also but to, to be to be the, fair, the, the 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 critic that mattered the most gave you guys three out of four stars. So Roger Ebert. That's true. That's was true. A fan. Yeah. So, but then you look at popular opinion. It's kind of like politics, yep. you know, where you have yep. you know you have a, a, a president or, or a politician, or whatever person that's of, of note that's popular with the people. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. their constituents are like you know, and, and of course, a lot of that is political. Yeah. In my case, you know, I'll go. I, I'll go ahead and say I can real some of it. You know, it could have been racial. Yeah, I, I agree. <laughs> you know what I I'm agree. saying? And um, you know, and a lot, you know, people don't want to kind of speak on that because it's like, oh, well, you know, that that's become such a, you know, like an elephant in the room. But like, let's address it. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, had no problem with being compared to you know like young eddie murphy but mm -hmm. when macaulay calkin's name would enter the same table with mine oh no he's no macaulay calkin mm -hmm. of course i'm not i am norman d golden mm second -hmm. but why is there such a a scoff you know what i mean mm -hmm. yeah. a scoff yeah when mm -hmm. that's when that's mentioned so mm -hmm. you know I, I for whatever it's worth like i you know i never again never let, allow that to 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 phase me you know, always because I know that, you know, life is life. And that's that's how my parents, you know, and it's funny because they didn't necessarily shield me. It's just like, OK, this is not something that you really need to know now. Eventually you'll learn it. You'll you'll I mean, because, you know, as I grew up, I looked at you know, I kind of go back and just kind of see what was being said. And I'm like, oh, OK, that's interesting. Yeah. You know, some of the things that were said about me and mm -hmm. Bird and all of that. And, you know, I totally understand, you know, but it, it never stopped, you know, my love for what I what I do. Mm. Yeah. And, and if you can remember, did you realize that you were a part of something special after seeing yourself on the big screen for the first time? Um, yeah, I mean, that it definitely. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll share a quick story. You know, when I when we did the we did the uh, the premiere and 
this was maybe about a week before uh, Cop and a Half had actually released it because it was a couple of premieres. We did like, you know, the industry premiere and then like a premiere for, you know, they invited the public. And so they invited these, you know, these, uh, it was a few schools in the air in LA uh, in the surrounding areas to come out to um, the amphitheater that used to be on, they replaced it now with something else, but it, it was a theater on the uh, universal lot. And so, you know, they, the kids were there and it was like a lot of people were watching it. And, you know, of course I'm still in the moment, like, well, this is cool. Like I've seen this movie now like four times, <laughs> but I, it, I'm ne- it's like, it's, I'm, it's never gets old because it's yeah. like a dream come true. Right. So, Mm-hmm. Long story short, you know, I'm signing autographs and whatnot after the, um, you know, the the premiere. But then, you know, I'm ushered off with, you know, from handlers, you know, my parents and I. And so we go out to the parking lot and there were like eight, I want to say eight or nine buses, school buses full of kids. And mm-hmm. they're like parked end to end, lined up, you know, in this huge parking lot. And so they're the kids are like waving and, and just like. I'm Devin Butler reciting your lines from the film. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I'm just like, what? And I think that moment right there really got me. It really yeah, like, you know, that yeah. going back and you know, harking back to the conversation that we were just having about like, you know, popular opinion fans, you know, yeah. fandom or whatnot. Mm-hmm. That showed me that, okay, yeah, this film is definitely a hit with the kids because they were just like, oh, that movie is so, you're so cool, Devin yeah. Butler. And I'm just like, whoa. Hell, yeah. Bo. It was like, <laughs> as, a, as a kid. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, understand, I, I was the target audience, so I got it. You know, yeah. um, mm-hmm, so yeah. I do want to, um, so in the 90s as a child star, and you kind of alluded to this earlier, so I want to bring it back a little bit. I don't think you could ask for a better feature film debut because I know you had, um, did some TV work uh, prior, but uh, as a feature yeah. film debut, um, you were laced up nice to where you have a movie that tri- almost triples his budget, um, mm-hmm. co-starring with uh, Burt Reynolds, Ruby D. And you, technically, I mean, you're the lead in that movie, I feel like. So, yeah. Um, yeah. you know, uh, so you're carrying <laughs> it. Uh, uh, Roger Ebert, like I said, at the time, um, I know uh, Siskel and Ebert, there was a lot of like um, racial bias, I think, with some of their uh, reviews on films. But for some reason, yeah. you earned his affection with the film and he gave you uh, three out of four stars. So yeah. uh, if if that's the first thing I see on a resume, for me, it's a huge plus. And I, I'm, I'm assuming more leading roles are going to follow. What barriers of entry existed for child actors back in the 90s, as well as mm-hmm. uh, Black actors? Well... One barrier for, we'll, we'll get this one out of the way first, the child actor yeah. thing. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's it's almost like, you know, executives, it's, it's kind of a necessary evil sometimes to have a child in a film. Um, usually, Cop and a Half was interesting in, in the fact that, like you said, I was the lead because it was, you know, Cop and a Half. So I, in the title itself, it was yeah. Bert and myself. You know what I mean? Yep. So we were two, the yep. two leads. Mm-hmm. Um, but but a lot of times it was, you know, if you look at, you know, kind of like a film like Mrs. Doubtfire, where mm-hmm. you had the kids in there and they were they had roles that were notable, but it was really about, you know, Robin Williams, you know, him dressing up as this woman so that he can be with his kids, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, so it wasn't as because um, the focus was mostly on on him, whereas in Cop and Half, again, it was this kid trying to be a cop, you know, yeah. whatever. So I think it there's kind of a, you know, like working with kids is not necessarily easy because there's not not a lot of kids that, um, you know, it's like it's fun to do. And but when they realize that they're that, that like this is work, you know, mm-hmm. you, you may have to be, you know, you may have to do a take five or six or seven or 15 times, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and then it's just like a repetition and, the, you know, yeah. it, it gets like, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. So it takes a special type of person special type of kid to have any longevity or or you know last in the industry as a, as a whole so i yep. think naturally e- executives and people that are looking to work with kids they're just like mm, i don't know because i don't know what kind of kid i'm gonna get and in mm-hmm. in my case you know both i think henry winkler can attest to this because you know he's a director and especially burt reynolds 
I mean, he's no longer with us, but I'm sure he would if he was here, could attest to the fact that, you know, Norman was very professional and he was on the money. I mean, sure, he was a kid, so he did kid things sometimes, <laughs> but, you know, he was very professional. So in a nutshell, I think, you know, it, it's challenging for, for child actors to really succeed because, you know, there is that, like, you're a kid, so I don't know, you're, you're unpredictable, you know, mm-hmm. to a certain yeah, extent, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. more as mm-hmm. with adults, you can, you know, you can threaten them with being fired and they might get back in line, but with kids, it's like, well, I don't care, fire me, I'm, I don't want to do this anymore. Anyway, you know what I mean? So, yeah, you know, just as, a, as an example. So, and then the other case, you know, when you talk about, you know, Black actors, I think, I mean, you can kind of let the data do the speak you know the speaking for that and and uh the data speaks for itself so to speak um Mm -hmm. in that sure there were a lot of you know there were a few there were a few you know former child actors that are black that have you know you know come up through the ranks and they've they've done well for themselves i mean i think about um one that comes to mind is michael b jordan you know Mm -hmm. i mean we just had creed three and you trace his career back and you know he's he started when you know he was he was young yeah yeah um you know, and like you got the Cosby kids. I mean, they may not be all over the place, you know, like, but they, there's a, um, what can I say? Like, there's, there's a respect that you have, like, they've done great things for, you know, in their oh, lives yeah. thus yeah. far, you know? Yeah. Definitely. Um, but I think one of the, one of the barriers that, you know, we have as, you know, black, young, black, excuse me, former child actors or child actors in general is our color. I mean, it, it, it's, mm-hmm. we cannot get away from the fact that, you know, the entertainment industry or any industry that you're in is a microcosm of the macro. We've been dealing with, you know, racial, uh, you know, color lines, all this kind of stuff for for the longest. So for people to think that it doesn't exist or doesn't affect you, you know, that's that's rose colored glasses. If I'm I'm just keeping it real, you know, mm-hmm. that that's not the case. The fact of the matter is, you know, I was, you know, like my mom would get wrote like when I was after cop and a half, you know, I was signed to um, ICM, which, you know, they're one of the three, yep. well, at one point they were one of the three biggest, you know, uh, three. agencies, yep. one of yeah. the three. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, to get there means you got chops, you have, yep. you're, you're marketable. You are a person that they know, okay, we can take this talent and they're going to be a star. So yeah. for me to get there, cause we didn't, you know, you can't, you don't change <laughs> You know, as an actor, you don't pursue ICM, CAA, come, WME. They like, they come to you. Yeah. Mm. You know what I mean? And they invite you in. So to be invited in and, you know, and to have my agent tell my mom, like, I'm I'm having challenges selling Norman's talent, mm-hmm. primarily because every other script they would get, oh, well, you know, they cast the parents who are white. So this is not going to work because, or... You know, in the case with like a film like Angels in the Outfield, where they're saying, you know, I was up for the lead role, but oh, well, you know, it's not, it's, it's, what was the, the reason for that was it wasn't, um, you know, which makes sense. Okay. The, the kid is a descendant of his grandfather who owned a team, a baseball team back in those days. So, you know, obviously that wasn't realistic, mm-hmm. but, you know, instead of offering the, uh, you know, the this, main the, character, they tried to offer you the uh, side, the, the, the friend, the, the best the friend. Psychic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, so, of yeah. course, you know, my agents are like, but you know, this is Norman DeGo in the second. He yeah. just did Cop and a Half, and some of the stats that you guys have just mentioned, like you know, this film did well, yeah. and like he's repped with us. So, are you kidding me? Like, yeah. we can't make an adjustment to no you know, dis- maybe having no disrespect you know, to uh to to uh jo- Joseph Gordon Levitt, but at that time, I think you had done more um from a feature film uh standpoint. So, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, and I'm, I'm very like, I, I th- that's something that I don't really speak on. Cause I, it's like, you know, I, I allow my work to be what it is, yeah, um, of course. but yeah, I mean, you know, it, it's, I've had other celebrities who, you know, I, I won't for, you know, sake of confidentiality and, and privacy, I won't name who have, you know, mentioned you guys would know them if I told you, it's like, yeah, mm-hmm. man, you know, you, you did, I mean, just with that one film, like that was you like that was some shit like you did the damn thing like that you opened (laughs) the doors for you know a lot of people and we're just kind of wondering like what what happened Mm -hmm. you know and Mm -hmm. it wasn't because Mm -hmm. i didn't want to do it it wasn't because you know my mom and my dad you know wasn't astute enough to continue you know my career in a certain path it was just the opportunities 
and you know the positioning and 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 just the 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 era the the not the era but the uh the you know just the space and you know we're, we're still dealing with this to to this day you know how yeah. you know black actors yeah. typically have it you know they have it a little little you know absolutely uh, rougher or different than yeah their counterparts you know yeah absolutely. so yeah. so you so speaking of uh we mentioned burt reynolds and mm-hmm. was that smoking and the bandit and gun yeah. smoke and he was quote, quote unquote i guess the heartthrob of that era him i would yeah. say maybe tom Selleck or i, I don't know you just name it <laughs> name <laughs> but um <laughs> <laughs> um Burt Reynolds, uh, you work with the likes of Oprah, Wesley Snipes, um, Patrick, uh, Patrick Stewart, and so forth. Um, being able to be around this talent um, in the industry, did you learn? Uh, did you learn anything, or did they, uh, uh, did any tidbits come from them while working with that? T- um. Yes. I mean, you know, you, you can't be around a person like Burt Reynolds, you know, for three and a half months and not learn anything. Mm-hmm. Same thing with Oprah. I mean, you know, I, I with, with Oprah, you know, once again, like I, I am very grateful. I'm grateful for all of the experiences, you know, that I've had, regardless of, you know, any of the issues that may have happened or, you know, around my career, you know, uh, or whatnot, you know, you know, we talked about the whole racism, whatever, but like, aside from that, I'm very grateful for, you know, um, the opportunities that I did have. Um, and the, you know, like with Oprah in particular, you know, she actually, you know, with the film that I did with her, like, she, like I didn't have to audition for that role. She basically made us an offer, you know, which I think I suspect that, you know, because the industry is oh, okay. it's, it's a small town, you know what I mean? So I, I suspect that there may have been some chatter around like, well, why isn't Normandy Golden Second like working his ass off now? Because like he's a promising act, mm-hmm. you know, and she probably got wind of that and was like, OK, here's my my silent support of this young talent, you know, mm-hmm. so I'm 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 I, I, really appreciate you know her her doing that um yeah but as far as learning getting back to as far as like what i've learned from them um you know f- with burt reynolds i learned that as far as like knowing who knowing what is most important when it comes to your career and your craft mm. you know um and he would say you know put your craft first because that's why you have a career and mm-hmm. with your career, your fans are one of the reasons why you have a career. So, mm-hmm. you know, you always speak to your fans. You always appreciate your fans because your fans, you know, when, when you can't get a job yeah. <laughs> or when you, yeah. you don't, you're not working or, you know, in, in any case, like in the case of your, if you're blackballed or whatever the case, your true fans are always going to be there. Mm-hmm. And you know, to have someone appreciate your craft that you work so hard on, that in itself, you know, appreciate that because yeah. that's that's not you know that's not something that um, I mean I think I I think that we we do kind of live in a in a in an era where you know fans just kind of like they people just kind of go with the flavor of the month. It's like oh yeah that, that. and then it, you know if there's a, there's a there's five or six people talking shit about something that they really really like then it's like oh, ah yeah. yeah as opposed to like well I don't care what y'all say I'm a fan you know I think we're yeah. kind of like in the '90s it was I think it was more '90s early 2000s where it's like I don't care what nobody says I'm a fan of this so yeah. I say yeah. all that to say you know the my true fans the people that to this day are saying like yo I have kids and I'm introducing them to <laughs> <laughs> to your work yeah. and they yeah. like it you know what mm-hmm. i mean like that's a fan and i yeah. truly truly appreciate that i'm so grateful for that and, and we hear that with a lot of the uh musicians or singers that we um we interview a lot mm-hmm. of them are saying you know or and Barry can attest to this his daughter or his kids can sing all the, the words to uh, the, the Jets, Jets uh, yeah. Um, uh, you you got, you got it all, and 
and wow. By, yeah. And by the way, my, my kids, I, I make sure we, we always binge watch sitcoms together that I grew up yep. on and mm-hmm. um uh cop and a half like like the, i put them on that like years ago like when the, uh, my mm-hmm. oldest was uh like seven uh she's okay. 13 now so that's something that we traditionally watch what every two years but it is mm. it's something that's caught up in the lexicon of like 90s classics and that same ballpark of your home alones and just kidding mm, yeah. uh, mm-hmm. vehicles yeah mm-hmm. uh bill mentioned some names and i'm not going to repeat them but just a lot of like uh, a-list talent um i'm going to throw some in there uh, Henry Winkler, that's the Fonz, uh, directed <laughs> Cop and a Half. Ruby D, also co star with you guys in that picture. Uh, Danny Glover, you work with Joe Pesci, you know, um, throwing those names into the mix. Did you have the foresight at the time um, to like really own in on your networking skills? Good question. No, not really. That's a great question, but mm-hmm. I, you know, not really. I think. Um, you know, I, I I came from a really authentic space, mm-hmm. um, and you know, knowing my fa- you know, if you know my family, my parents, they're they're they never was, you know, it, it occurred to them that okay, at, from a business standpoint, yes, you know, it's necessary mm-hmm. to network and all that. But as far as you know, I was concerned as a mm-hmm. as an actor, as a child, like you know, I connected with these people, you know, purely on an artistic basis or you know as a as you know more of a friendship Mm -hmm. um i think it was necessary for me to do that because i was able to uh maintain the authenticity of what i was doing and that that speak Mm -hmm. going harking back to you know the advice that burt reynolds gave like he gave me some advice but then he also actually gave advice he gave me advice via just dialogue and and you know just kind of me being able to watch his Mm -hmm you know, his actions and how we, you know, uh, moved and grew together. Mm -hmm. Um, But he actually gave my parents advice. And one of the uh, bits of advice is that uh, bits of advice, bits of advice that he gave my parents was, um, you know, basically to not allow me to get caught up in like industry things, like things like networking, like keep the purity of what he's doing. That stuff will come eventually. Mm-hmm. If he chooses to have a career, you know, as he matures and, and gets into adulthood, he'll learn all that that stuff. But right now, it's necessary to keep him away from that because it'll ruin the spontaneity and the authenticity. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm glad that they did that because I was able to, you know, maintain um, just really being an actor, just love, loving the craft. And to this day, it's like what's first and foremost for me is the craft. Mm-hmm, you know, yeah. I mean, obviously, when you're trying to like in, in my case, you know, when you have films that are in development and you're, you know, you're kind of like on the business side of it, you have no choice but to kind of do that. But, you know, my thing is I'm always excited to delve into the creative part because that's really what it's about. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we see uh, many actors and actresses start to transition into being a little more. Uh, they start to go into the producing and the directing part of uh film you know film uh tv mm-hmm. shows films and so forth um you now or are part of that mix um we do know yeah. you're doing some you know you're doing a lot of things as well um mm-hmm. outside of in front of the camera um how yeah. has that transition been for you to make that step going behind the uh, camera um well i think for me it's a natural it's a natural progression. Uh, most children, I mean, you know, you have children, so, you know, children are curious. I was mm-hmm. a child once and, you know, I was very curious. So when I would, you know, I was filming all these films, you know, I was definitely in between takes, you know, talking to the cameraman and, and wondering, you know, what's that mm. do? What's this thing? What's that? You know, and, and just kind of <laughs> looking at the world behind, you know, behind the scenes really like you know I'm, I'm we're in front of the camera and that's fun and all that but it's like I, I so I, I you know after a while I learned what that was all about but then it's like okay well how do we get to this point you know and so I think it just became a like I said before a natural progression for me as I got older and you know realized like you know one of the great ways to you know even if, if the industry is not inviting you to do roles or whatever the case like you can you can always create your own and you know 
do it on a smaller scale. But, you know, again, like I was saying, if you, if it's, if it's what you really love to do, then that's enough, you know, so you just create until, you know, you have someone say, Hey, you know, that's, this great. I want to buy it. And then, you know, that's great. But again, you're maintaining the love and the authentic authenticity of, of, of what you do. Yeah. Okay. Um, and just like athletes and musicians, we, they tend to um, pattern their style after others. Uh, Kobe definitely has, has, has patterned himself after Michael Jordan. You know, um, LeBron, maybe a little Magic Johnson, some other people, and some vocalists, so forth, uh, who sing producers and so forth. Um, who did you, I guess, once you started to understand a little bit more of the acting and so forth, who did you take a liking to? Maybe not pattern your acting style after them, but maybe, mm-hmm. hey, I like how he does that, or I like how he does that, or how she does this, or how do any skills you pull from any people? Oh, yeah. Um, initially, actually, when you talked about, you know, your family sitting and watching sitcoms, you know, that's what I used to do with my family. So the Cosby kids were a huge inspiration. Oh, um, yeah, I yeah. really yeah. paid attention to, you know, like Malcolm Jamal Warner, because like, okay, that's big bro, you know, and then, you know, Olivia, or Raven Simone, because we were around the same age. So I'm like, oh, this kid is like, that's like, we're the same age. And she's like on TV. That's cool. Like I can do that, you know? Mm-hmm. So that was actually my initial inspiration. Um, as I got older, you know, and was able to watch some of Eddie Murphy's work. <laughs> I was going to say that's where um, the comparisons were, but. Yeah, yeah. And, I, you know, I wasn't really watching a lot of his stuff because mm-hmm. for obvious reasons. Um, <laughs> but as I got older, <laughs> you know, I, of course, I'm yeah. like, you know, Eddie Murphy, he's, a, you know, he's a he's a genius. He's a comedic mm-hmm. genius. And, you know, he's done, you know, pretty well for himself. Um mm-hmm. So, you know, yeah, Eddie Murphy, Malcolm Jamal Warner, and Cosby Kids. Um, Don Cheadle, I think, is amazing. Um, Definitely is. Gosh, I mean, now I'm kind of drawing a blank because there's so many that I, I have a lot of respect for. Um, let's see. Lawrence Fishburne, mm. Samuel Jackson. Um, can't forget Denzel. Um, I didn't start with him because that's kind of like a... That's the go-to. You know how people cliche like, is like cliche. Yeah, 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 yeah. And and I, and and no no disrespect to Denzel because he's amazing. You know, I just like when you look at a person like Samuel Jackson, he you know he has like a theme, you know, a, a, a like a through line of of the type of character that he he plays. But it's so many different variations that it's like this guy is like what can he do? You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Um, so I, I have a lot of respect yeah. for, for that. Um, yeah. And uh, let's see, I already mentioned Don Cheadle. Um, yeah, Lawrence Fishburne. Yeah, Angela Bass, even, you know, female, Angela yeah, Bass. Yeah, Angela Bass, yeah. Um, oh, man. Yeah, I mean, I was even even Oprah to a lesser extent. Some people be like, well, you know, she's a talk show host, queen, whatever. But nah, when you look at something. Versatile. Oh, yeah. Versatile. And, you know, she's, and with me having the, getting the, you know, having the, uh, the opportunity to work with her. I got a chance to witness that up, up close and personal mm-hmm. and, you know, working with her and then seeing her on color purple and going, you're going like, wow, like she, she's an actress. And mm-hmm. I don't think a lot of people really understand like Oprah Winfrey is a beast. Like she yep. can, she can, she does great work. You know what I mean? So she's definitely a person that I've, I've, you know, watched and, and admired and, and, and whatnot. Well. She she owned that Sophia uh character. Oh man, oh man, Goodness. like with everything. Yeah, <laughs> she yeah. owned and that. I don't think, and I don't think anybody would have been able to do you know that character justice but her. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, I think I think that's but that's that's pretty much with with any of the characters. Like if you look at uh what's love got to do with, for example, like you know Angela Bassett Angela. and Lawrence Fishburne. Yeah, like I mean they yeah, yeah. yeah. they were they were I could tell like you look at they were I can tell who else would have been able to do what what they did with that you yeah. know yeah. yeah so um Mr. Uh, Golden like I said this this has been a pleasure for me I, I grew up 
uh, on Cop and a Half is definitely one of my, <laughs> you know, top 10 favorite uh, coming of, it's not a coming of, it's, it's a buddy cop film, but at the end of the day, mm-hmm. like to see a, a young kid in that role, get, get a chance to give his uh, principal a uh, ticket. That's definitely, <laughs> I, think I, I, I lived vicariously through your character. Yeah. So we we actually just survived 12 r- uh, rounds with a champ. We really appreciate you joining us for today. You have a lot of other stuff coming down the pipeline. Where can folks keep up with you to figure out what's up next uh, for uh, Mr. Golden? Good question. Uh, answer to that would be, uh, you know, I'm on social media, um, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Uh, my Facebook is, you know, Norman Golden the second. Um, my Instagram is actually Golden Child II, uh, lowercase. Um, Twitter is the same, Norman Norman D Golden the second, I believe. It's on Twitter. I forget that one, but yeah. So mm-hmm. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. Um, I have a website. It's www.normandgolden.com. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's those are pretty much my outlets. And just as a spoiler, bro, uh, everybody head over to his social media. We'll have the information on the screen. Uh, just a spoiler alert before they head over there. What's the uh, wh- what are you currently working on that we should be anticipating right now? Okay, so I actually have a few things in the pot, but two mm-hmm. that are first, like you know, like right there, ready to happen. Um, I have a feature film that is actually in uh, development. Mm-hmm. Um, it's Good. called uh, tentative t- tentatively titled Hood Adjacent. So it's about um, I play my name is you know Barry. I play this uh, <laughs> real estate. Yeah, that song, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, <Yeah>. right? <laughs> it's a character named Barry. I, that's why I had to because normally I don't, you know, for confidence, y'all. Have one, but I'm like, I have to mention that because yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, <laughs> and, I play and, Barry. This, and just uh, real estate. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, and just as a triple reference, my my name as well as uh, your film as well as the director of Cop and a Half uh, won an Emmy for his work on Barry. So I just feel like it, it comes. Yeah, it comes all the way around, well, but go ahead. It comes around. There you go. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, so I play, you know, this real estate developer, his name is Barry, who uh, is basically tasked with gentrifying his old neighborhood. Mm. Um, okay. And he's, he's this, this is happening, like, during the holiday season. So, obviously, you know, he's done well for himself, but his community is like, you know what you've been doing? He's like, yeah, I do. But, you know, that band's in the driveway, like, feels mm-hmm. better than me caring about you know, whatever else. So Mm -hmm. he finally gets to a point where, you know, his wife is kind of like that, like, okay, hey, you know, pulling his coattail, like you're getting ready to now like bulldoze your old neighborhood. You realize like, you know, your mom is still there and your aunts and cousins and people that you know, like they're, you're going to basically just tear everything down for for them, you know, their life, their livelihood. Mm -hmm. And so that relation, their, his relationship with his wife kind of struggles and, so now he's trying to figure out, you know, what's really important, the dollar or preserving the community in which, you know, made him the man that he is today. And, you know, uh, you know, being as successful and all that stuff is like that community is what, you know, kind of helped you become successful, you know. Mm-hmm. So it's uh, it's called uh, tentatively titled Hood Adjacent. Um, developing that right now. And then I'm also developing a TV show um, centered around my experiences as a former child actor turned adult, you know, writer, producer, director, trying to navigate, you know, all the things that we talked about at the top of this, uh, the, the top, the first round of this interview, if you will. Um, and, you know, how he, how he does it, how he manages to, you know, navigate some very funny, very challenging, very cringeworthy situations with mm-hmm. people in the industry, fans, and, you know, any, you know, people in between. Um, and still keep his head on, you know, straight and and focus on his dream. Can't wait. Sounds, Sounds good. amazing. Yeah. I'm, Sounds uh, good. Yeah. I, 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 I was going to cut you off with uh, Hood Adjacent. I, I felt like um, I can't wait to see what he decides, but I didn't want to get um, let you give away too much. But a lot yeah, of memorable well, nah, moments. I can't do yeah. that. I can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but um, a, a lot of memorable moments to come. But ladies and gentlemen, um, Hey, feel free to chime in in the two cents uh, in the comment section. What's your favorite mm-hmm. uh, moment uh, from uh, Mr. Uh, Norman's uh, uh, ch- childhood career as a child star? Let us know. Mm-hmm. Leave your two cents in the comment section. Mm-hmm. Also, let us know who we who we should be basically uh, bringing on as a next uh, guest for unanimous decision. Can't wait to hear some of your comments. Bill, 
in addition to that, what's another way they can show support? Hey, they know what to do. Uh, like this video, leave a comment, hit that notice notification bell so that when we upload any new content, you're automatically uh, notified. And don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Awesome. All right. This concludes another episode of Unanimous Decision. Uh, thank you for tuning in to Anne in this corner. Peace.